<clears throat> Welcome everyone, you're at the Silver Hill Hospital Grand Rounds. We'll get started in just a moment as people settle into their Zoom boxes. All right, welcome everybody. I am Dr. Jeff Katzman. I'm the Director of Education here at Silver Hill Hospital, and we are absolutely delighted to have you join us uh, today when our privilege to welcome Dr. Mark Fry, an old friend of mine who will be presenting on the topic of emerging discovery to innovate beyond best practice for bipolar depression. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Fry in just a moment, uh, but first, as always, some housekeeping details. Today's lecture concludes our 2022 Grand Rounds series, and our time has really flown by together. After Dr. Fry's presentation, we will have uh, held a total of 20 Grand Rounds this year, all virtually, and we are glad to say that many of you are regular participants. We are busy constructing the 2023 series, based on our hospital needs and gaps, as well as feedback from you all, which we greatly appreciate. The 2023 calendar will remain virtual for the time being, and our first presentation starts on January 25th with Dr. Doug Zatzig presenting on developing and implementing screening and intervention for PTSD and comorbidity in the US trauma care systems. We'll aim to send Dr. Zatzik's invitation in early January, and you can also check our hospital website calendar, which can be found under education and resources. For today's lecture, if you wish to receive education credits, CME or CEU, please complete the evaluation survey that will pop up in the browser when the webinar ends. We will also email a copy of the evaluation after the webinar concludes. We would love to hear from you. Today, I look forward to moderating a Q&A discussion with Dr. Fry at the end of his lecture. And this uh, part of the presentation is an important component, and we will welcome your questions and comments to Dr. Fry. You can submit those at any time during the lecture using the Q&A box on your screen, either with your name, or if you prefer, you can submit them anonymously. Finally, disclosures. No planners of this activity have indicated a relevant financial relationship with an ACCME defined ineligible company whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. It's now my great pleasure to honor uh, and honor to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Mark Fry. Uh, Dr. I met Dr. Fry when we were residents together at uh, UCLA, and it has, uh, it's an uh, honor and pleasure to, um, Mark, to, to be with you and see you years later. Dr. Fry was born and raised in Rochester uh, and received his MD from the University of Minnesota and completed his psychiatric training at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He subsequently completed a fellowship at the National Institute of Mental Health in Bethesda, Maryland, with a research focus on the neurobiology of treatment-resistant depression and bipolar disorder. His current research centers on biomarkers of mood disorders and alcoholism, complementing his international clinical expertise in mood disorders and addiction. Dr. Fry and his team established the Mayo Clinic Individualized Medicine Biobank for Bipolar Disorder, to identify the underpinning mechanisms of bipolar disorder through genomic studies. An active clinical investigator, he's received research uh, support from NIMH, NIAAA, Mayo Foundation, Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, and industry partners, and has published more than 400 peer-reviewed papers. He has received numerous awards, including the American College of Psychiatry Mood Disorders Research Award, the Gerald Clerman Senior and Young Investigator Award from the DBSA, the Robert Post MD Mentoring Award and Mogan Shaw Education Award, two Mayo Clinic Rome Mentorship Awards, and three UCLA Department Medical Student and Resident Teaching Awards. 
Dr. Fry is the president of the National Network of Depression Centers, a network of 23 academic centers of excellence collaborating in clinical innovation, research, and education, and the Scientific Advisory Board Vice Chair and the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance, a leading national organization whose mission mission driven to improve the lives of people who live with mood disorders. Dr. Fry, quite a career since I knew you back when we were residents together. So thank you uh, again for uh, accepting the invitation to join us here today. And um, it's great to see you. I'm gonna turn um, my video off now and I will return with Q&A at the end of your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Katzman. It's great to, to see old friends in a virtual environment, hopefully in person soon. And good afternoon, everyone at Silver Hill. Um, I'm ever so pleased to have a chance to, to meet with you today and present uh, an, an, a, a very interesting area, of, uh, I think, for our field. And that really is reviewing the chance to discover and innovate to improve and go beyond best practice. And in this case, really focusing on bipolar depression. Great, great to be with you this December day. My disclosures are presented here. I do have research support from um, AssureRx uh, Health. I will not be presenting any data from that study. Uh, I uh, do have financial interest in previous work that we've done with biomarkers and depression through Chimea LLC. Again, I will not be presenting any data from that study. I will be presenting off-label use of antidepressants, ketamines, stimulants, transcranial magnetic stimulation, all of these do not have an FDA approval in bipolar depression. I will be presenting in the context of some of our work to talk about how biomarkers might inform future clinical practice. I will be presenting pharmacogenomic data. Uh, this data is not related to AssureRx uh, or any commercial support, but has been supported by Mayo Foundation. So, the goal for today is threefold. One is for the clinicians in the audience wanted to really review and illustrate the limitations of our current FDA approved pharmacopoeia for bipolar depression. That is how we, in essence, practice evidence-based medicine in targeting the depressive phase of bipolar disorder interspersed through these evidence-based treatments, I'd like to try to have you think about what a future clinical practice would look like. To be clear, this is not contemporary clinical practice today, but really introduce the concept of biomarkers and how biomarkers, as we study them further and scale them, could potentially inform and personalize the practice of bipolar disorder, again, focusing specifically on the depressive phase. This is a very select set of examples that I hope are the best teaching examples of how our practice may be informed in the future. The examples of biomarkers are many, but I will focus on some work that we've done with functional imaging and pharmacogenomics. I'll then close with really setting the stage of how future innovation and and developing and going beyond best practices might in, uh, evolve in the future. What would actually be the platform or the infrastructure to do that? And we'll review with you some very exciting emerging opportunities through a bipolar learning health system. So let's start here. Um, I'm at the Mayo Clinic. I live in Minnesota where our winters are very long and very dark. And we can absolutely see a seasonal component to the depressive phase of illness. This is simply an example of uh, a, a, a compilation, actually, of several patients that I've worked with trying to underscore the key components of the depressive phase of bipolar disorder very often with a atypicality to it, that hypersomnia, hyperphagia, um, uh, reverse diurnal variation to mood that we can often see in, in bipolar depression. 
this example was really to underscore how very limited the pharmacopoeia is for the depressive phase of illness in comparison to the great number of FDA approved treatments for mania and, and frankly, um, uh, significant underdevelopment for the depressive phase of bipolar disorder in comparison to major depressive disorder and schizophrenia. So I'm showing you here um, the working update of evidence-based FDA approved treatments, pharmacotherapy for bipolar depression. That's that um, third or the second column from the right. You can see when we look at FDA approval overwhelmingly, there has been an emphasis on drug development with atypical antipsychotics. Many of them FDA approved for mania, fewer FDA approved for depression, cariprazine, lorazidone, lumetaparone, the combination of elanspine, fluoxetine, and quetiapine. Recognizing that when um, individuals with bipolar disorder are symptomatic of their illness, knowing that they're far more likely to be living with depression, both from the standpoint of symptom severity and duration in comparison to living with mania, to see so um, few regulatory approved treatments uh, certainly is worrisome. So just to Underscore that again, we have four atypical antipsychotics that are approved for the depressive phase of bipolar disorder. You see them listed here. A concept that we'll talk about throughout this um, best practice review of the depressive phase of illness is the merits of really what I would call maximizing the mood stabilizer, optimizing doses of lamotrigine, optimizing doses of lithium. We will review off-label use of dopamine compounds, ketamine, antidepressants, and again, notably, with the exception of fluoxetine in combination with olanzapine, every single antidepressant approved for use in the United States for major depressive disorder does not have an approval for bipolar depression. And we're gonna talk a fair amount about this, just given the, the prevalence rates and the morbidity of depression and how much fewer treatments we have. We'll touch base on a couple of psychotherapies that I think are very helpful and would really underscore the importance of biomarkers in the context of all interventions of, of treatment for bipolar depression, whether it be pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy, neuromodulation, everything. So let's talk a little bit about a, what a biomarker is. This is often a very elusive term with um, many uh, different um, connotations of meaning. This is a paper that was written by uh, a, a colleague of mine who spells his name the, uh, the opposite way, Benicio Fry. Uh, this was a biomarkers task force from the International Society of Bipolar Disorder, wanting to really review with the community of clinicians, um, researchers, persons with lived experience, the potential for biomarker development in bipolar disorder. So when we use the term biomarker, we are referring to a a quantification of a biological process. That biological process can be related to having the diagnosis yes or no, staging the illness in some way, or being associated with a particular treatment response. In order for biomarkers really to transform, inform clinical practice, we want them to be valid, reproducible, acceptable to patients and easy to interpret. And this is where I would give an example, a saliva sample, if that was to be a biomarker that could really be informative related to some aspect of disease, that's probably going to be easier to accept, easier to scale nationwide, worldwide, in comparison to perhaps a functional imaging paradigm that might need an intravenous line and an arterial line, lots of other things to think about. So that scalability, ease, ease of, of interpretation is an important concept, I think. We obviously scientifically want biomarkers to have adequate sensitivity and specificity. And then you can see in the last part of the slide on the left, kind of what I would refer to as developmental stages of biomarker development. 
we first want to identify what the biomarker is. And if we have a signal that's positive, we want to validate that and then really scale that to see how predictive it can be from the standpoint of comparing it to um, a, an individual that has a biomarker positive versus a control. And then finally, as we typically see <clears throat> with large scale industry trials, um, a um, full scale randomized controlled evaluation. On the right side of the slide, I'm showing you different types of biomarkers. We can have imaging biomarkers, we can have blood biomarkers, we can have genetic biomarkers, um, lots of um, variability. What we're simply looking for is quantification of a biological process. So let's quickly review treatments. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide other than to say, yes, there has been significant drug development with atypical antipsychotics really having the majority presence in the bipolar pharmacopoeia, primarily in treatment of mania. I think it is a reasonable clinical conclusion to say that antipsychotics as a class, and in this case, I would actually add first generation and second generation, are all effective anti-manic agents. That is not the case for the depressive phase of illness. And you could argue, well, that may be in part related to study design, but it actually might be related to these drugs and mechanistically how they may be different in really targeting depression. <clears throat> Going from left to right on this slide, I'm showing you the response data of olanzapine and olanzapine fluoxetine combination, the two studies of quetiapine, aripiprazole, and ziprazidone. In this slide, all the gray bars are placebo, and all the blue bars are um, active drug, and if different shades really represent different doses. What I want you to take from this slide is really recognizing the FDA approval of a lanzapine fluoxetine combination and quetiapine. And in contrast, you don't see an approval because the regulatory studies phase three for aripiprazole and ziprazidone did not separate. And it may be study design, but I think it's a, a fair conclusion to say that these drugs may differentially impact or target depressive symptoms. We have an FDA approval of lorazidone. We have an FDA approval of cariprazine. I wanted to show you the newest FDA approval. And this is the drug called lumetaparone. This is an, anti, an atypical antipsychotic. What I find interesting about this medication is there is a glutamatergic mechanism here that is uh, prominent in ways that we don't see with the other atypicals. But the data, as you see here, um, was very consistent with previous study designs, a randomized six-week trial. Unique to lumetaparone is that it included both bipolar one and bipolar two individuals with depression. Starting dose is therapeutic dose. And this was really based on some earlier dose finding studies in schizophrenia. But the trial design was 42 milligrams of lumetaparone versus placebo. Very customary uh, endpoint ratings with the Montgomery Asbrook depression scale and clearly showing improvement, uh, significantly more so drug over placebo in both BP1 and BP2 patients. Side effects that were most common with lumetaparone in comparison to placebo were somnolence and nausea. Um, and I think we are going to um, get more data with this medication as uh, the post-marketing uh, data comes forward. This is FDA approved as monotherapy or as an adjunct to lithium or valproate mood stabilization. So let's shift to non-FDA approved treatments, but this one in particular where I would argue there's a very strong evidence base for using lamotrigine and while lamotrigine's FDA indication is in the maintenance phase of bipolar disorder, I think the clinicians at Silver Hill have a practice very similar to mine, where there's really recognition of the benefit of lamotrigine in the acute phase of bipolar depression, in this case, off-label. The off-label is really related uh, to the top five studies that you see in this meta-analysis. <clears throat> 
if we go to that first study, SCAB 2001, this is actually the study that was published by Joe Calabrese that really showed that lamotrigine uh, was significantly better than placebo in treating bipolar one depression. Now I use that term maximize the mood stabilizer. There was secondary analyses of this study that suggested that 200 milligrams had a greater symptom reduction than 50. And that really guides my clinical practice today. When I'm starting the treatment, I will try to get into that window of 50 to 200 as tolerated, but generally try to get closer to 200 for that type of data. You can see that the subsequent industry studies of 210, 910, 0924, and, and 1022, the next four big purple squares, fail to show a separation between placebo and lamotrigine. And that is why um, the FDA regulatory approval for this drug does not include, include the acute phase of, of, of bipolar depression, but in fact, as a maintenance mood stabilizer. The bottom study was done by our European colleagues, van der Luce et al. And the design really looked at outpatients with bipolar depression on lithium maintenance. Whatever that dose was, whatever the blood level was, the trial design was adjunctive lamotrigine versus placebo. And you can see that adjunctive lamotrigine was associated with a greater reduction in depressive symptoms. And I would argue that that uh, study really, I think, has informed clinical practice quite meaningfully where we see that lithium lamotrigine combination often. Now, when you look at this meta-analysis done by John Geddes, you see that the overall finding does show a significant benefit of lamotrigine over placebo in the acute phase of bipolar depression. Some secondary analyses of these studies suggested a more robust response with more severe depression, but this is really the data that I think has informed clinical care quite meaningfully with this mood stabilizing anticonvulsant targeting the depressive phase of the illness. So let's start thinking about biomarkers. You know that a biomarker is a, is a biological quantification that in this case, we would be looking at to see whether or not it would be associated with treatment response. Let me show you a couple examples of how this might actually work with lamotrigine. Again, these are research studies. This is not current clinical practice. Um, the hope would be these research studies might inform our future clinical practice. So I'm showing you a very simple mechanistic diagram of how an epileptic neuron, lamotrigine is an anticonvulsant, works. So looking at the left part of the slide, excitatory amino acids, glutamate, aspartate, when these are released from the neuron, they um, are actually what is associated with increasing neuronal stimulation or excitation and leading to seizures. This is a very simplistic point of view, um, but I wanna show you, and so what, what, what the slide is showing is all that blue excessive stimulation in the lower part is really based on the excessive release of excitatory amino acids, glutamate and aspartate contributing to uh, neuronal excitation and in essence, a model of an epileptic neuron. What I'm showing you on the right is what lamotrigine does. And the first step that's quite critical is that second box that says repeated influx of sodium ions blocked. Lamotrigine sits on an ion receptor and blocks the subsequent extracellular release of glutamate and aspartate, these excitatory amino acids. So the thought is, are we, the thought is we're having an anticonvulsant effect by reducing that glutamatergic um, uh, or excessive aspartate tone. It might be easier to show it this way. So what I'm showing you here is a presynaptic neuron and I'm showing you a yellow egg, which is a molecule of lamotrigine, LTG, that is sitting in a voltage-gated sodium channel. Blocking that channel blocks the extracellular release of those excitatory amino acids in blue. GUL is glutamate. ASP is aspartate. And you see those red Xs. By lamotrigine blocking the channel, we are blocking the secondary release of those excitatory amino acids into the synapse. 
So if we're blocking the release of aspartate and then we are building up the intraneuronal levels of aspartate and we're in the mitochondria and we have acetyl-CoA around, that excess in aspartate linked to acetyl-CoA will create something called n acetyl aspartate. Now that is actually a measurement of neuronal viability that we can look at in a functional imaging paradigm. And this is a study from many years ago that looked at an open trial of lamotrigine. Um, this was funded by a GSK study. And our, our question was very simple. When lamotrigine was given to bipolar patients, is there a spectroscopic signal that changes or might be predictive of response. So what I'm showing you here is um, a, uh, a sagittal cut of an MRI scan and that yellow square is our spectroscopic voxel that we would conduct a spectroscopic evaluation and generate a number of neurochemicals that you see presented on the right side of the slide. So for those of you who are old enough, if we remember those old radios where we would tune in to a radio channel for our favorite rock station or our favorite um, uh, national public radio station, this is very similar to that. You see a number of different resonances that are biochemicals that distinguish each other by their, uh, their frequency shift, in this case, chemically, that you see on the bottom of that row. That very tall signal is a measurement of N-acetyl aspartate that we were very interested in looking at before and after lamotrigine for the reasons mechanistically we just showed. So this work was published by my colleague, Paul Kroarkin, and what I'm showing you is 15 bipolar patients on the left part of the slide in blue. And you can see that at baseline, before starting lamotrigine, they have a significantly lower level of N-acetyl in the anterior singlet in comparison to age match controls. Now, again, on the left side of the slide, I'm wanting you to look at that baseline blue bar and then compare that to the 12 week bar. That's 12 weeks of lamotrigine. And what we can see is over the course of 12 weeks of lamotrigine, that NAA signal increases and it increases significantly in such a way where it does not appear to be different than the control NAA that was obtained um, uh, earlier in the study. On the right part of the slide is a very similar type of NAA measurement, but it really is looking at more of a three-dimensional NAA and we can see a very similar finding. We found this very intriguing. This was suggesting that lamotrigine may normalize a neuronal viability marker NAA deficit associated with treatment. I would call this a brain response. In this study, we did not find any relationship between normalizing an NAA deficit and improvement in depressive symptoms. So our study conclusion was functional imaging, in this case, spectroscopy, that might be a way to think about drug mechanism of action, suggested a deficit in NAA that appeared to normalize with lamotrigine, but was not associated with any mood response. So we started thinking more about that mechanism. So what I just showed you was aspartate and NAA or a neuronal viability measure. We were also very interested in the glutamate signal. So this is a bit of a complicated slide. Let me walk you through it from left to right. Again, thinking about biomarkers. So we have imaging as a biomarker, but if you look at the left diagram, I am showing you what we call the glutamate glutamine cycle. And this is a model uh, that has been studied in many neuroscience um, preclinical investigations of alcoholism, mood disorders, um, and, and certainly um, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder as well. 
GLU is that excitatory amino acid glutamate. And if you look at the center of that slide, you see that that GLU is going through that orange egg. And that orange egg has the letters EAAT2. That stands for excitatory amino acid transporter 2. It is a protein transporter that moves the excitatory amino acid glutamate from the synapse to the astrocyte. And then you see that GLU going to GLN, which is a more neutral amino acid glutamine. And that whole circle, that cycle continues from synapse to glial cell to neuron to synapse to glial cell to neuron. We know that there is genetic variation in the EAAT2 transporter. And we were very interested to look at the relationship between the transporter variation and actual measurements of MR spectroscopic glutamate, as you can see with the MRI signal in that second diagram. This is a small study. Um, I would really see it as more feasibility for multiple biomarkers. I'm showing you in the third diagram, a group of 19 depressed patients that were um, common, homo common homozygotes for this genetic variant. Think of it as having a normal amount of transporter. The group that had the minor allele carrier and less transporter actually had significantly higher levels of glutamate. So this really told us that there's merit in really thinking about functional imaging, relationship to genetic variation, and thinking about it in the context of clinical outcome. So to see that glutamate levels may differ by genetic variation as to how glutamate is transported from synapse to glial cell, we thought was interesting. But we wanted to think about that a little further. Knowing glutamate and knowing that we had access to our bipolar biobank and with collaborators at the Karolinska, the slide figure that's on the far right is showing you these very genetic variants and the variant relationship as to the presence of rapid cycling in our bipolar biobank. What the red bar and the orange bar are showing you is that patients who have the variation in EAAT2 with higher glutamate levels actually have higher rates of rapid cycling. You can see that with the red bar. Let me repeat that. The genetic variant that's associated with higher glutamate levels is associated with higher rates of rapid cycling in bipolar disorder. The red bar is significantly higher than the orange, and the orange and the yellow, which is a major depressive disorder, show no difference. What's interesting about elevated glutamate levels and rapid cycling bipolar disorder? Well, we go back to one of these old studies. This is where I think things get very interesting. This was a study looking at lamotrigine versus placebo for rapid cycling bipolar disorder. Maintenance trial design, and what I'm showing you with the couplet of bars on the left part of the slide is that lamotrigine had a significant reduction in rapid cycling in comparison um, to placebo. So the red bar for lamotrigine had a higher rate of response, less cycling than placebo for all comers. When we looked at um, dividing that entire group into BP1 versus BP2, we see that really the more robust response is coming from bipolar type two disorder. So if we think about this from beginning to end, lamotrigine mechanistically is changing glutamate levels and aspartate levels. Aspartate might actually prove to be linked to functional imaging levels of NAA, a marker of neuronal viability that could potentially be a, a biomarker for future clinical practice. Glutamate, in particular, with partic in particular with a specific genetic variant, may actually increase uh, in ways that a medicine like lamotrigine blocking uh, extracellular release of glutamate with a potential therapeutic effect. To be clear, these are biomarker research studies. This is not clinical prime time. But as we move forward, we need to start thinking about biomarkers that 
would allow us to use current treatments with greater precision or actually biomarkers that would really be de novo out of new studies as treatments come forward. Last example of lamotrigine, and this is really moving into the genomic world. Um, lots, of, uh, lots of us are aware of um, ability to study very specific types of candidate genes as to how a drug might be metabolized. We would refer to that as a pharmacokinetic um, study. We also can look at very specific candidate genes associated with perhaps a treatment response, and we refer to those as pharmacodynamic studies. When we are much more agnostic, we're not specific to a pharmacokinetic or a pharmacodynamic gene, we refer to those as genome-wide association studies and to see what a genome-wide association study would be with an anticonvulsant response was the goal of this study that we did with our colleagues um, with the Bipolar Biobank at Mayo in collaboration with the Lindner Center of Hope. We had a cohort of about 200 patients that had very well described treatment response over the course of treatment with uh, anticonvulsants valproate or lamotrigine. And what I'm showing you on the slides that are on the, on the right side is genome-wide significant hits in a gene called THSD7A and a gene called SLC35F3. The, the numbers aren't so important. The concept here is with well-described clinical outcome measures for individuals in our biobank and looking at whole genome-wide association, we see interesting signals that appear to be associated with a good response to lamotrigine or valproate. THSD7A is a gene that encodes for a protein that is related to maintaining the neurovascular junction of neurons and blood cells. Um, ABCC1 below that is a gene that encodes for a transporter protein pushing drug out of the cell. These don't seem coincidental that we would be getting signals that really linked to neurovascular function or perhaps pharmacotherapy uh, transport that we'd like to study in much larger ways. Again, small pilot study. This work has actually um, uh, allowed us to initiate a mood stabilizing genomics, hence most gen consortium that's now trying to scale this up in a larger level. Again, not ready for clinical prime time, but imagine a day where we might try to have a blood draw that would guide us to considering something like lamotrigine or valproate. So let me shift now to medicines that really do not have a very strong clinical evidence base. And I would uh, propose to you that maybe we revisit them with a more careful eye as to what we're looking for. Let's take modafinil, armodafinil as an example. Our group many years ago through the Stanley Foundation Biport Network was very interested in looking at modafinil and our placebo controlled trial was positive. Adjunctive modafinil was more effective than placebo in reducing symptoms of bipolar depression and did not have any increased risk of induction of mania or hypomania. Um, the field or the company moved to the R enantiomer of modafinil called R modafinil. And you can see um, the study by Calabrese um, in 2014. Fry 2015, Ketter in 2015. The first study of armodafinil, like modafinil, was, plus up, was positive. The second was negative. The third was negative. And when uh, you have two out of three studies that are negative, that is a failed program for drug development and FDA approval. We were very interested in kind of putting all of the modafinil and armodafinil studies together. And you can see by meta-analytics, they do show a significant difference from placebo. This is where I start thinking about mechanistically, I would contend 
that clinical trials of bipolar depression are harder than clinical trials of major depression because we have this variable of wanting a treatment response, but not at the expense of inducing a manic or hypomanic episode. And that is a complex study design. You can appreciate that drugs that have an FDA approval for mania might be a little easier to study from the standpoint of targeting depression because we already know of their anti-manic effect. But when we think about antidepressants, or in this case, stimulant like compounds like modafinil or modafinil, designs for these can have a level of complexity that we would not see with conventional mood stabilizers. Knowing how dense and predominant depression is, I really wonder if it might be of interest as a field to go back to these types of medications and perhaps look at groups that did respond and was there a clinical feature to that group that wasn't apparent in the non-response group or was there a biomarker? The likelihood of that happening with old compounds is small, but I ever remain hopeful for those types of strategies. Again, the concept would be can we use biomarkers in the, in the spirit of precision medicine to use existing treatments um, with uh, greater specificity, greater precision? So let's spend some time with what I would say arguably is one of the most controversial areas in psychiatry, let alone mood disorders or specifically bipolar disorder. If your practice is like mine, I use antidepressants and bipolar disorder regularly. And we have to really recognize that the evidence base for that does not equate to the use that we see these treatments having in bipolar clinics. First bullet, I'm really showing you what I think is probably the single best largest study. This was a placebo controlled trial of paroxetine quetiapine and placebo for bipolar type one depression. The antidepressant as monotherapy was no more effective than placebo. An antidepressant did not improve depressive symptoms significantly more so than placebo compound. Second gray bullet, what we worry about with these antidepressants is the potential for induction of mania or hypomania. And you can see that treatment emergent mania was significantly less with quetiapine. That makes sense in comparison to the antidepressant and placebo, which is 11% and 9% respectively. Now you could argue with this study that the switch rate wasn't really diff wasn't higher with the SSRI looking that it really resembles placebo 11 and 9%. Second blue bullet, when we look at meta-analyses of large randomized controlled studies of antidepressants versus placebo or comparators, we do not see a strong signal as a large cohort of bipolar patients responding to these treatments. The other thing we worry about is, is the safety of these medicines and the risk of a switch with something that's invariably referred to as an anti depressant induced mania. The good news from these larger studies as a large group of patients is we don't see an acute risk. There might be something with that antidepressant in a switch rate over the course of a year. I would argue that that probably is really not the drug and might be more the course of illness. I think some of the most interesting data that has been published recently is from that fourth bullet where it may be that antidepressants in bipolar disorder will be more effective if they are with atypical antipsychotics. So that fourth bullet, this is the McGeer study that looked at the rate of antidepressant response when it was coupled with an atypical antipsychotic, AAP, so think about all the atypicals that are FDA approved for treatment resistant depression. This is basically looking at those compounds in bipolar depression. And they actually do appear to be helpful for bipolar depression in a way that we just don't see when the antidepressant is coupled with a mood stabilizing anti 
agent like lithium or valproate. That's interesting. And it also makes sense with how we see the spectrum of efficacy from treatment resistant depression, namely the combination of an atypical and an antidepressant with bipolar depression. So I wanna take time to really pull out a very special group of bipolar patients. And these would be individuals that have never had a manic episode or psychosis and mania, specifically bipolar type two. This is really where the signal for antidepressants looks much more encouraging. Um, a number of these studies were done by Jay Amsterdam at the University of Pennsylvania. And you can see that second bullet uh, comparing in a double blind fashion venlafaxine to lithium for bipolars in a 12 week study. Response rates significantly better with the antidepressant. Remission rates significantly better. Importantly, no switch difference at 12 weeks and six months. And with venlafaxine, that's saying something. The switch rates of what of antidepressants we tend to worry about, that's the one. In this case, not an issue. When we pulled out bipolar twos specifically with rapid cycling status, where we would worry that the antidepressant might even accelerate the cycling further, again, we saw efficacy with safety. The second trial is a, a study um, that looked at lithium versus sertraline versus the combination. And interesting data here showed, again, no difference in response, no difference in switch, but a side effect burden or dropout rate that was higher with the combination, which again, makes sense. So I wanna highlight this um, study done many years ago, and this was a mentor both for Jeff uh, and myself, the late Lori Altshuler. And I think it really underscores a very important concept that is probably present in a minority of bipolar patients, but important and critical nonetheless. So let me paint the picture of this, of this trial. <clears throat> These were bipolar patients, on a mood stabilizer, depressed, who got started on an antidepressant, did not have a side effect, did not get better, sorry, did not have a side effect, did not get manic, and got better. And the question that this study was trying to answer is what's the risk of relapsing to mania versus depression when that antidepressant is discontinued after achieving a good response? And you can see that when the drug is stopped before six months, we see a relapse. This is the bottom survival curve. And it's a relapse back into depression, not mania. So the longer that antidepressant stays on board, six to 12 months is the middle blue line, greater than 12 months is the top line, we see lower rates of relapse to depression. Now, in our Stanley study, this probably represented 15% of the cohort, but it suggests an important key variable that I know clinicians will recognize with some of the individuals they work with in their clinic. There are a group of bipolar patients, likely depressive predominant, where maintenance antidepressant pharmacotherapy is a maintenance mood stabilizer for them. It would be ideal to have a biomarker or a clinical variable we could better understand that would be associated with that longer term antidepressant response and get that treatment to that individual at the earliest time point possible, as opposed to trying other medicines or therapies which might not be as effective. That's the benefit of developing biomarkers for this. So our group has been very interested in really understanding that risk of overshooting, starting with an antidepressant and in a short period of time getting manic. Um, we looked at the world's clinical literature um, uh, over 10 years ago, and it is here. And a couple of things that struck us as really relevant for clinical practice. Top bar, it's kind of an obvious one. If there's not an anti-manic mood stabilizer, that risk is very clear. We know that the tricyclics, imipramine is the prototype, probably have the highest rate of antidepressant-induced mania, and I think that's why we see 
decreasing and ever decreasing uses of tricyclics and bipolar disorder. Notable exception is probably that low dose of amitriptyline in hospital. Um, there's very clear data to, to suggest a noradrenergic risk in particular with subclinical hyperthyroidism. But the two bold uh, fonts were of greatest interest to us. And let's first review mixed depression. Sorry, what I, um, before we get to that, let me tell you that this concept of starting an antidepressant getting manic has lots of different terminologies to them. Um, and it can vary by study design. So for example, that registry that I see that I'm showing you in the top blue bullet, that's probably the best study from one of the registries in Sweden, really showing that the risk of treatment emergent mania is significantly elevated within the first three months of treatment with absence of mood stabilizer. That kind of makes sense clinically, and, and I see our practice really reflecting that. If we're looking retrospective, that number can be higher. So the step BD uh, project from over a decade ago, patients self-reported antidepressant-induced mania up to 40% of the time. Third bu bullet is from our bipolar biobank, where we had a not just patient report, but electronic health record review confirmation from a clinician reviewing DSM criteria, a very narrow window of eight weeks of starting treatment, and we got a, a rate of about 31%. Better studies, lower number. If we look at meta-analytic work of controlled bipolar trials, that switch rate is about 12.5%. Um, um, and uh, that is higher when used with an antidepressant than not. And that last bullet, that's the proxicine study I showed you, which showed a very low switch rate. Now I have to say, as controlled studies become more advanced, the generalizability of those may be less. For example, I suspect for the emboldened study, um, there may have been some um, hesitation by clinicians or uh, persons living with bipolar depression to go on an antidepressant by itself without a mood stabilizer, and we may lose some generalizability in that regard. But let's let's shift to that mixed depression. So through our Stanley studies, we had a um, randomized uh, trial looking at three different types of antidepressants: bupropion, venlafaxine, and sertraline. The data I'm showing you on the right is the baseline ratings of mania before starting antidepressants, kind of looking at what's the baseline set of depressive symptoms, what's the baseline set of manic symptoms before starting antidepressant trials. Remember that all clinical trials of bipolar depression, we monitor for the induction of mania or that switch rate, so we're always tracking manic symptoms. And to give you that perspective, a YMRS score, a young mania rating score of 12, generally is thought of as hypomania, 20, generally thought of as mania. I'm showing you three groups on the right part of this slide. The group that's in purple was a group of bipolars who were depressed, started antidepressant treatment, and either dropped out of not getting better or were identified as non-response. The blue group, that's the group that got on the antidepressant and responded to antidepressant treatment very nicely. The red group, that's the group that when starting antidepressant switched into a manic or hypomanic episode. What I'm showing you is the significant difference in young mania rating scale scores between them with the red group the ones who would get manic with the antidepressant having a significantly higher YMRS score. Now let's put this in perspective. This is a score of just under four. Again, hypomania 12, mania 20. There's, they're nowhere near syndromal, but it starts to really speak to this concept of subsyndromal mania or mixed symptoms, manic symptoms, in sub manic symptoms in syndromal depression. And that mixed pattern 
having a greater risk for a switch when exposed to antidepressants. And you can see on the left part of the slide that we saw three key features from the mania rating scale, the motor activation, pressured speech, and thought content that drove most of that signal. Those three symptoms really lined up with a concept that was evolving in DSM-5, the concept really having that mixed specifier. And I think the data that I just showed you really resembles uh, the late Hagapa Kiskel's visual of, of that depressive mixed state. You can see the syndromal blue depression, these little purple spikes of subsyndromal manic symptoms. This clinical data and the, and the nomenclature of DSM-5, I think has actually been a significant advance in clinical practice. In my clinical practice, when I'm working with an individual with bipolar depression and I get all the depressive symptoms, but I'm also getting a sleep disturbance and an activation pattern um, and a pressured speech pattern, I am not starting an antidepressant. I am working with a mood stabilizer, a psychotherapeutic intervention, something else. Let me tell you a little bit about our antidepressants-induced mania work from our bipolar biobank. We've had the honor of really uh, building this over the last 10 years. Uh, I have been working with my colleague, Dr. Joanna Birdaka, a statistical geneticist, building this from um, a sample size of zero to a current sample size of 2,500 individuals living with bipolar disorder who have been gracious enough to partner in research and um, allow, um, have a sample of their blood stored with DNA and plasma and serum uh, connected to deep clinical phenotyping to look at genetics or other biomarkers of disease risk or treatment response. This is in collaboration with our colleagues at Linder Center of Hope, Sue McElroy, and a number of our postdocs at Mayo that have returned to their homeland and are contributing to the sample still, um, Dr. Cuellar Barbosa and Dr. Prieto in Monterrey, Mexico and Santiago, Chile. Um, our University of Minnesota colleagues have helped as well. The phenotype of interest for us, I'm showing you um, in the middle, and that's the antidepressants-induced mania. Our study looking at the serotonin S allele, the serotonin transporter and antidepressant-induced mania is at the bottom of this meta-analysis. And we did not find a statistically significant difference in the short form or the S allele and antidepressant-induced mania in bipolar disorder treated with antidepressants. Nicholas Nunez, one of our uh, postdocs at Mayo now, has completed a meta-analysis. And you can see when we bring all the studies together, we see nominal significance. Is this changing clinical practice today? No. Is it something we should be thinking about going forward? Yes. I would argue that serotonergic me genetic mechanisms when studying serotonergic antidepressants make sense to, to study. I simply want to highlight, as you can see in the bottom part of this slide, there has been virtually no uh, investigation of norepinephrine transporters or dopamine transporters, which may be just as relevant. So this is that concept of these Canada genes really focused pharmacodynamically that we need to study further. I um, for time, I'm going to move quickly. This is really one of our secondary analyses of that paper, and it looks like there might be a configuration of genetic variation, what we call a haplotype, that might be protective against developing an antidepressant-induced mania. This is not clinical practice today. If this observation can be repeated, we might have a situation where if we're wanting to use an antidepressant, could we have a biomarker that could give us for example, an actuarial risk of in induction of mania. And if that biomarker looked like it was associated with antidepressant-induced mania, we, we go somewhere else, lamotrigine, an FDA-approved atypical, um, a, a psychotherapeutic intervention. That's where some of the biomarkers here have potential to inform future clinical practice, but we need larger studies. Um, this is a, a study that is under review, but I wanted to share a concept with you. And through 
uh, collaborating with our uh, genomics colleagues, again, post uh, Dr. Nicholas Nunez and, and on the right, Dr. Brandon Coombs, we've been thinking about polygenic risk scores or PRSs. And I would have you appreciate that a polygenic risk score is an overall estimate of the propensity of genetic uh, of a genetic estimate to be associated with a trait or a phenotype. In this case, antidepressant-induced mania. I'm showing you here um, individuals from our bipolar biobank that have, under careful review, a history of an antidepressant-induced mania, which we call AIM positive. Um, and then you can see in the, the graph, the, the, the second row is really an antidepressant-induced mania, specifically with SNRI antidepressants or the venlafaxine types of drugs. Our comparison group is a very large study of more than 5,000 patients with major depression treated with antidepressants and looking at the, the, the genetic risk score of responding to the antidepressant. What I'm showing you here is suggesting that the polygenic risk score that is associated with responding to the antidepressants in this large consortium for major depressive disorder is significantly related to the polygenic risk score that's associated with an antidepressant induced mania in bipolar disorder. What, are, what am I saying here? It really would suggest that the the genetic propensity of responding to an antidepressant and major depressive disorder looks similar to the genetic propensity of getting manic from that antidepressant in bipolar disorder. Think of it as a spectrum. For me, this really underscores not only Canada genes that we need to study, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin transporters, but looking at the entire genome and really thinking about genetic technologies that can inform biomarkers of potential treatment response and how we might use that clinically in the future. These types of data need to be replicated at the large scale level before they are going to have clinical mainstream practice. But I wanted to show you where genomic biomarkers are already in our clinical practice. The bar, I would say, for a genomic marker to be associated with treatment response is pretty high. But the bar from a safety perspective, as defined by the FDA, is lower for obvious reasons. Safety and black box warnings really suggest potential lethality of, of drugs and we need to be mindful of that. And two examples of pharmacogenomic markers that are in black box warnings really relate to antidepressants and carbamazepine. So antidepressants uh, can change the electric rhythm of our heartbeat. And there is one that we pay attention to, which is a corrected QT interval. When that becomes prolonged, it increases the risk of potentially lethal ventricular uh, arrhythmias, such as torsades to plant. We know that many medications, uh, many antidepressants are metabolized through a pathway called cytochrome P450-2D6 and fluoxetine, peroxetine, a number of others are metabolized in that pathway. We now can identify if people have a variation in 2D6 where they're poor metabolizers, where they can't metabolize fluoxetine, theoretically having significantly increased levels of the drug that in this case may predispose to a QT prolongation. Now to be clear, this is not the only risk factor family history, electrolyte disturbances, but it's an example of where pharmacogenomic testing has entered our clinical practice from the standpoint of safety and black box warning labels. The second example is really carbamazepine and identifying a, an, an HLA antigen that is associated with the life-threatening rash of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Now, this is in a very select population of uh, individuals of Asian and South Asian Indi Indian ancestry. But I think it really speaks to the FDA uh, uh, 
um, importance of really looking for factors that help us first do no harm. And I uh, do see the HLA uh, testing specifically for carbamazepine in uh, many clinical practices. Let me close with one last genomic um, uh, consideration. We do very little um, thinking about how a drug is metabolized, the PK, and how a drug hits um, the brain, which we think of more as pharmacodynamic. This is a study that we completed through uh, the, a large uh, um, uh, NIH-funded STAR-D and PGRN-funded uh, study looking at the pharmacogenomics of SSRI response or non-response, and for non-responders, a subsequent study with an SRI treatment such as venlafaxine or duloxetine. The main piece I'm wanting to show you is on the right part of the slide. When we start looking at a pharmacokinetic with a pharmacodynamic interaction, we start to see meaningful differences that response rates for individuals treated with venlafaxine or duloxetine where they had previously failed an SSRI, we can see a ultra rapid metabolizer, metabolizing the medicine quickly, and a LL genotype or lots of serotonin transporters pharmacodynamically really associate with response. If we're gonna be doing pharmacogenomics, we need to be doing it with more interactions and more genome-wide approaches. I'm mindful I'm, I'm running a little long on time, just got a couple minutes left, but I wanted to show you one last um, uh, study and then and, and, and a, a program that's emerging that I think has great potential. We've been very interested in thinking about mitochondrial dysregulation as a mechanism for disease pathogenesis and bipolar disorder. And one of my colleagues at Mayo, Thomas Kozic, has operationalized this concept of suboptimal mitochondrial function and how we might study that at different time points within illness. We were very interested in thinking about suboptimal mitochondrial function as a contributing factor to relapse in established disease. Let me walk you through this slide. On figure A, I am showing you the epicenter of energy regulation in a mitochondria, and that is called the electron transport chain. Going from left to right, C1 is complex one, complex two, three, four, and five. This is how we actually generate energy. Thomas Kozic and his postdoc, Dr. Emerzal, um, recently reviewed all of the preclinical or animal literature of different types of psychotropic medications that you see in figure B, those are the rows, and how they impacted electron transport chain or mitochondrial energetics. And they coded the drug as either increasing mitochondrial activity, decreasing mitochondrial activity, or a mixed result. In the lower left slide, you see four antidepressants that were shown to increase mitochondrial function, paroxetine, nortriptyline, venlafaxine, and bupropion. And you see two in the blue bar that were shown to decrease mitochondrial function, amitriptyline and s citalopram We've looked at our biobank and we've asked the question, are rates of antidepressant-induced mania higher when the antidepressant in question has been shown in preclinical studies to increase mitochondrial energetics? And that answer is significantly yes. The rate of antidepressant-induced mania for drugs that have been shown to increase mitochondrial energetics, paroxetine, nortriptyline, bupropion, venlafaxine, was 20%. The rate of antidepressant-induced mania with drugs that have been shown to not to decrease mitochondrial energetics, in essence, amitriptyline, s 10%. We control for all the clinical variables that are associated with AIM, and yet we see this very unique finding that we want to study further. I won't spend but just a moment looking at how effective psychotherapies can be for bipolar depression. This is work of David Miklowitz, 
that is showing the benefit of family focus therapy, interpersonal social rhythm therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy, all three of them performing better than uh, a standard clinical care. This is specifically targeting depressive symptoms and bipolar disorder and very helpful. Our work at Mayo looked at trying to do IPSRT, interpersonal social rhythm therapy, in a group setting. And this was a two-week program. And if you look at the middle bars, you can see the IDS, which is the inventory for depressive symptoms, go from a 35 to an 18, significant reduction. The program stopped. We called patients 12 weeks later, and we really saw that the level of mood improvement had been sustained. These are powerfully helpful treatments for the depressive phase of illness. We've got to find a better way to have greater access for these treatments uh, so that a larger group of individuals can find benefit. And again, I would argue um, thinking about biomarkers alongside would be very apropos. In the next several months, you are going to be hearing about uh, a lot about a program that's called BD Squared. Breakthrough Discoveries for Thriving with Bipolar Disorder. This is a transformative um, time point in clinical care research and optimizing uh, lived experiences for individuals with bipolar disorder. It is a large effort going forward that has four major blocks that you see here. There are conventional research grants that are called discovery grants or genetics grants, brainomics grants. I wanted to talk to you about the integrated network. The integrated network is going to combine deep clinical phenotyping and care in the hopes that the combination of deep phenotyping, clinical ratings, neurocognitive tests, MRI volume, um, digital data from um, smartphones, genomic studies, deep phenotyping in the context of a longitudinal cohort of bipolar one patients being tracked over five years, we think this is the most imperative uh, mechanism to better understand the illness, getting that patient data, analyzing findings, identifying key outcome measures, looking at perhaps vectors of association we might not have thought of before, putting that together to really drive change to enhance and promote better outcomes in bipolar disorder. And we think of this as a integrated network where sites are currently being, being recruited, where the hope would be the clinical care, the deep phenotyping, allows us to better understand the illness and design better treatments or outcome measures in a learning health environment. And I look forward to uh, this having greater visibility in this country and worldwide as it moves forward. So let me close by emphasizing we have a regulatory-based uh, treatments for bipolar disorder they're limited. They're almost exclusively atypical antipsychotics. And I think they speak to um, the um, difficulties of trial design. Um, I'm sorry, I think I'm on the wrong slide. Let me, here's my conclusion, I apologize. So we think that reflects the complexity of study design. Clinical evidence would suggest that antidepressant monotherapy is not helpful and probably not safe. Now, not everyone is gonna switch with an antidepressant and we can really see that evidence base very clearly with bipolar type two disorder. I think pharmacogenomics has a potential to be a biomarker that can inform future clinical practice, but we need to go beyond how a medicine is metabolized or the serotonin transporter. We need to think of that as an interaction and frankly, look much more broadly at the whole genome, the whole epigenome. We want to further think about suboptimal mitochondrial function and could that be a biomarkers to think about disease pathogenesis or perhaps adverse events related to antidepressants. I would say just in closing that um, there is profound public and personal health benefit and impact if we can start thinking about 
biomarkers of treatment of good response and frankly next to that biomarkers of adverse events such as uh, mania and my hope is that our learning health networks that are being designed will absolutely drive innovation to answer these clinically relevant questions thank you very much for your time i really want to recognize all of my colleagues uh, along the way at mayo clinic um, at ucla um, at nimh and um, the groups of people that are mission driven to to really enhance uh, uh, the lives of individuals living with bipolar disorder thank you very much i'm going to stop my sharing and then ask dr katzman to guide our q a thanks jeff dr fry what a tour de force presentation it's an honor to know you my gosh um uh so so much that you know and thank you again for uh speaking with us today we have a few uh, um questions in the q a that we'll get to please we have about 15 minutes left everybody if you have questions for dr fry please um put those in the q a you caught my attention um mark with the interpersonal social rhythm theory and uh, therapy and i think i thought i misheard you that you said it was two weeks i was long how how long was that intervention actually because i'm kind of wondering about it in a more residential um treatment program of 30 days exactly. So I, I think think some of the early studies of IPSRT, Jeff, are much longer. We chose at Mayo two weeks exactly the way you're thinking. We have an outpatient program, uh, an intensive hosp hospital-based outpatient program for two weeks. It unfortunately has not opened up after COVID. It will be soon. And we also have a residential program. Our study design was two individual sessions to get the individual oriented to the concepts of IPSRT, but then really have the rest of it be in a group-like setting. I've been amazed at the level of um, engagement and learning new material is enhanced when it's with peers for many people. Um, that younger person, older person, the, you know, the people that are the same age, there's lots of combinations that make that very valuable. And I was just struck to see that two week learned knowledge was contributing to a ongoing reduced depressive burden 12 weeks later. So we really designed that to fit into our two week program. Ideally, I could see that it could be longer if it was a longer term residential programming. Wow, fantastic, fantastic. I will write to you uh, with more questions about that. Uh, Kenneth Burr has written in a few different questions. Uh, I'll go through here. Um, the first is, does uh, the lamotrigine study that you mentioned on glutamate provide an explanation for a Robert Post decades old hypothesis that anticonvulsants are the treatment of choice for rapid cycling for which carbamazepine was originally used? So um, Robert Post is my old boss and my old mentor. So I, um, I, I think I'm preaching to the converted. I, I would say that I think it's a mechanism to really study and as uh, this colleague is referencing one that has been studied for a long time and has some value thinking about neurobiological illness progression. To be fair, we know that many of the atypical antipsychotics that I wouldn't think of as anti-glutamatergic can be very effective for rapid cycling. Frankly, um, most of the atypical antipsychotics that are FDA approved for mania had secondary analyses that looked at um, uh, that response rate differing with or without a rapid cycling pattern and it looked the same. So um, interesting idea, but it probably expands beyond glutamate and anticonvulsants. Gotcha. And what do you think about, um, also from Kenneth Berg, what do you think about using the Motrogene as a replacement for lithium in classic bipolar one when lithium side effects are interfering with functioning? I've had one patient with severe bipolar one who's done very well on lamotrigine and quetiapine for 15 years. Very supportive of that. I think this really speaks to a excellent clinician and really paying attention to um, degree of mood response and as a risk benefit ratio to side effect burden. Um, I would argue that it'd be really great for the field to try to better understand biomarkers of who does well with lithium lamotrigine versus quetiapine lamotrigine versus neither. But yes, that seems like a reasonable clinical intervention. Um, and, and is there anything uh, to the old uh, saw that bupropion is less likely to induce switching? Um, 
I would say yes. I, my, my hesitation was really emphasizing probably the better way to answer that is tricyclics and specifically venlafaxine. And when I, and venlafaxine has been replicated. So I kind of just then start to be curious about whether it's really SNRIs that really has the highest rates of switch rate. I don't know if we have enough data to compare SSRIs to the propion, but I would see both of them as having less rates this, than SNRIs. But I think one of the points I, I wanna make is that's great that the rate is less, but more than zero is unacceptable. And that's where precision medicine ideally would find who are those individuals that are at greater risk for a switch with um, an antidepressant and can we actually get them to a more effective, safer treatment? Uh, just uh, concluding from Kenneth Verb, um, it says <laughs> fabulous uh, presentation and wonderful work from someone whose career began working with Seymour Ketty and Ross Baldessarini on neurotransmitter turnover and ECT uh, to the Lab of Clinical Science at NIH with Julie Axelrod and Erwin Copen. I am delighted to see all these developments. Really a pleasure to, to meet and entertain your questions. Thank you. And uh, Steve Beagle um, says uh, also he's um, thanking you deeply for the presentation. He is in drug development and uh, your presentation showed um, how, how deep you go and how deep this topic goes um, and says this is uh, really amazing. Um, I have a, uh, in the absence of other questions, let me just ask you one more question clinically, Mark. If um, I, I was intrigued by this idea of clinically with your patients, when you see work with a patient with depression, um, with even um, a, a mild degree of hypomanic symptoms, potentially of um, not sleeping and um, uh, agitation or um, rapid speech, how do you delineate those from kind of an anxious depression um, and, and thinking about, about that just in your clinical wisdom? Well, so this is classic Jeff Katzman asking um, a erudite clinical question that goes beyond the, the data that we have, but I appreciate it. And I think, um, I think this is where DSM really advanced and said, if you're going to use that mix specifier, the, the subsyndromal symptoms have to be unique to mania. So they cannot be kind of symptoms that we might see in DSM criteria for major depression and hypomania. So if we really focus on that, um, that might help address your question to some degree. Um, you know, what might be a good example of that? Um, you know, someone who is um, so energetic with their lack of sleep that they're really very goal-oriented in their productivity, but yet they're anhedonic, depressed, nihilistically preoccupied, and suicidal. Um, that would be a good example of a really clean, um, mixed specifier with truly hypomanic symptoms, and that would be the group that I would stay away from antidepressants. You're highlighting, I would argue, probably a much more common group. Um, where it's kind of the anxious distress comes across as looking hypomanic. I don't think we have a good response with that. Um, even though we don't, you know, this is where if you, if we kind of think about that treatment resistant depressed concept, which clearly is going to have clinical correlates of anxious distress. Um, and we have an evidence base of atypicals, both in TRD and in, in, uh, that one study for bipolar depression, that's probably where I would lean. I think the only time I would say, you know what, this is a level of obsessional anxiety that has to have a higher dose of SSRI, for example, I think I'd want to be really confident that I see that obsessional piece, um, you know, whether it's Frank OCD or, um, just the capital O of OCD, then I'd be comfortable with the antidepressant. That may be more of an answer than you were hoping for. No, no, that's fantastic. I could uh, talk for hours with you about all this. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, uh, I think we are done with our questions and we are done with our time. So um, Dr. Fry, I just wanted to, well, first, it's just great to see you again um, after um, a long period of time. So thank you uh, on a personal level for joining us and and um, for really an inspiring presentation.
everybody out there, thank you so much for joining us today, for joining us um, over this year. I hope everybody has healthy and safe holidays and uh, rem thinks of us come January as uh, we will be, be returning, as I mentioned, with our presentation from Dr. Zatzik in January. As a reminder for those wishing to receive CM CME and CEC credits, please complete the evaluation survey that will automatically pop up in the browser as the webinar ends. So uh, I'm, uh, again, grateful that you've all joined us today and over the course of the year. Happy holidays to everybody. When we end our webinar, we, uh, as, I, as I like to say, it's a little jolting as we all um, disconnect and wind up in our own rooms. So thanks again, Dr. Fry. Thanks again to all of you and see you next year. Thanks, Dr. Katzman. Happy holidays.